Okay. 319 Drift Drive. Okay, I will not be participating in as much as I am in immediate butter. So I'm going to sit in the audience. Okay, we'll go right to the um, the over aerial view of the property. And we'll go back to that site later. You know, before we do that, I want to have a little discussion about uh, section 14.3 of the bylaw location. At the time that we adopt, I think there may be what, there may be a typo in here which may solve some problems. At the time we adopted this bylaw in 1997, amended in 1998, there was no such thing as local business. There was just limited business. Correct. And Route 47 South was zoned business. What is now zoned local business was zoned full business and Route 47 North was zone limited business. But local business didn't exist until about five years ago. So I am wondering if in the recompilation of the bylaw, there may have been an error that crept in. Now it may be, we will go back, I don't happen to have older versions of the bylaw with me tonight but I do have older versions back in my office. And it may be that we will find that that was, that originally read limited business and that the uh, code compilers. They changed that. Changed that. Okay. Um, now that might or might not help. Uh, I think, I forget how wide the limited business district 300 is. Feet. 300 feet. We are in limited business. Well, the front of his in limited business. I don't know where your tower would be in relation to no, that. In in where they are at 319 River Drive, they are not in limited business. Well, because the limited business stops at McCretzky's Corner. Okay, let's see the 2008 one. I believe the limited no, business, limited no, business no, goes up to, to North Hadley, where North Hadley goes up to Cummins Road. Goes up to Cummins Road. Oh, okay, okay. All right. I thought I stopped at McCresky's corner, but all right. We, we well, that's, oh, I don't well, have that's the old version. That's a point because, you know, the compilation that we have, and the only thing we can go on now is the fact that it's, it's they're proposing a, a use that it is not allowed in yeah. so the district. The, well, it, that's the question, is well, that it? Is, that is a question yeah. about what we have before us in, in at least yeah. the, uh, I'm not recalling. Lisa has a 2008 version of the bylaw, and that says that the uh, land located in the business and industrial districts doesn't say anything about local business or limited business. But now it does. So, now it does. So Great. somewhere along the line, I think our friends at General Code no. And this goes, to, I mean, when we got the information, it says limited business, so. Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not yeah. sure. I, I will have, have to go back to the original right. text, really, I think, to find out. And what the Attorney General approved. Um, but um, I, I, I just, we're, we're not going to get this resolved tonight because we need to do some research on it. I'll check, but I'm taking the position in this presentation that we're not in the overlay district. So okay. As far as, for purposes of our presentation because I think we're covered anyway. So um, so we'll, let's, we'll go over the site and um, give you the particulars on this location. So as you can see, it's a um, site that's the current operation of Montgomery Rose. And uh, so a very disturbed site, a um, lot of activity on the site. And what was uh, most um, interesting to us is that there already are stacks, what we call exhaust stacks, at the site. And so what we're proposing is to build in this site what we call a stealth design, um, which you just asked about. And in this case, it's going to be an 80-foot exhaust stack, basically. It looks exactly like what's already out on the site. This will be a, 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 a pole, a unipole, that will be made of steel and fiberglass. Um, we'll also, similar to the E Street, we need an equipment building, and we'll be erecting a 12 by 24 um, equipment building. Um, Carlo, if you want to give the 
Okay, for the record, Carlos Centore with Centec Engineering. Um, on this particular facility, what's being constructed is a uh, 40 by 45 fenced compound, equipment compound. It's to the south, it's the southwest corner of the, uh, behind the southwest corner of the existing building on site. What that compound uh, contains, if you don't mind going to the next slide, is a 12 by 24 equipment shelter. Uh, propane tank for fueling of the diesel generator at this site, uh, utilities for the site, and uh, a, um, a unipole uh, tower. And this particular one is 80 feet. I'm sorry, they're getting mixed up. Uh, it's an 80 foot unipole tower. What that is, is a steel uh, monopole structure. Uh, with the top 30 foot section having a steel spindle on the interior and then a fiberglass shroud on the exterior so the antennas would not be visible. Um, the intent is to have it match the existing stacks that are on the site. Uh, in terms of dimension, it's 30 inches at the top down to 30 feet and then it tapers out to uh, about 40, 48 inches, 49 inches at the base. Again, this tower is designed um, as, uh, as class three under the EIA, TIA uh, standard uh, only, and not because it's a, an essential facility, but if it should be used by uh, town emergency services, it would, it would fit that classification, but also because of its proximity to the adjacent building. That, that class three, again, is to ensure that the structure has some additional safety built in because of its proximity to uh, uh, structures and, and uh, people. The other, the other nice thing about this structure is because of its size, the size is driven by the fact that it has to house antennas. So the diameter of the shaft is actually much larger than it needs to be for structural reasons. So under, under full load, uh, with, the, with a, 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 a nominal, uh, typically 3 8 inch, 5 16 inch steel tube, which is typical of these structures, the maximum rating would be at about 4 to 5%, which is not, not nearly enough. It's a very safe structure. Um, utilities are brought in underground to the site. Uh, all you'd see is the fenced-in compound in the area in the back. We've got a call for some landscaping around the base uh, and uh, 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 some privacy slats within the chain of the fence. <coughs> okay, um, you can go back to the slides. So that, what I want to show you is. Um, it, assuming that we are I mean, limited business is not part of the overlay um, district, I just want to point out that this is the area where we need the coverage. And if you're looking at the permitted overlay district, there is nothing in this area of town. So that um, <clears throat> in order to um, allow us to be in uh, to meet the coverage needs that we need in that area, we are going to be. Um, you know, we have requested a waiver. We would need that waiver, which you're authorized to grant. Um, and I'm going to call on Jay again to now describe the coverage that we will be providing from the site. If I could, I, I have one thought. I did a little research in, in town-owned property. There's a sewer treatment plant up there, or sewer pumping station that's within sight of this location. I know we, we check every town location, so um, and I'm not sure if that one's part of the application, but I know that we looked at all the town sites. We would we would have preferred to be on a town site. We would. We would have the same experience, good experience that we had in dealing with the East Streets, and then we wouldn't have to deal with the waiver. So I know that that was a site that we considered. Yeah, I don't know how big the uh, the sewer uh, pump station there is, but building twenty by twenty. Is it around Stockbridge Road? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's and it's it's right. within within a few hundred feet of this site, so but you probably just missed it. It's small. Um, the RSA acquisition person isn't here, but again, if there was a town site, we would, I can't believe we wouldn't have considered it because we we would have preferred that. Would you, would, rather than taking a, all of us mm -hmm. taking the time to go through everything, would you just flag where you uh, where you address yep. that mm -hmm. for our next mm -hmm. time? I have one other question too. That since we're, this is being used for public safety communication, you were saying that that was the reason you needed to have a lattice tower. Why is 
the Unipol satisfactory this is in this location. It's not going to have the same, if I understand, the same equipment that's there. It's going to be like a lift, or it's going to be something that's going to supplement what is going to be at the East Street site. I don't know. Maybe the chief can speak to that. Well, the whipping antennas also are omnidirectional, so if you had a, a large monopole with a sidearm with your whip antenna, the back side of that pole would not receive coverage mm -hmm. broadcasting in that direction. But a lot of towns use the lattice structure in order to let that bleed through. One of the, one of the selling points here is that it is a new selling point as of, uh, as of the last month that Verizon is now offering the town a placement on this tower, and that was not part of the original application. So I'm just wondering, is that just a throwaway of some sort, or is it a legitimate mm -hmm. communications it's a, improvement? It's a repeater antenna that's being proposed at this site, so it's a single single use antenna, unlike the site at the, the town site where the, there are multiple antennas oh, and whips yeah, uh, that yeah. are better accommodated by a lattice tower. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different use. It's to, it's to get more signal within that limited area. Yeah, that's the way that uh, we understand it as well, that it's it's more of just a bounce-off tower, it's a repeater. So if you're further up north, it hits that and then bounces to the station. Okay. You feel that that would work? Or it, it would help? It we, would we've got similar points in town already, and it seems to be beneficial. You know, going back 10 years, radio service was even worse than it is now. And, I know there's one down in the area of the mall, and there's one in North Hadley Hall. So it does seem to improve the service. And we're hoping that another one further north, because the town is so long in that direction, would be beneficial. The, the town of Hatfield appears to be closer to the North Hadley Tower than the one on East Street. Uh, are you concerned about the overlap that we were talking about on East Street? On the coverage? Yeah. Yeah, Jay's going to talk about that. Yeah, I can speak to that. I just Excuse want to be me, sure. Are, are you referring more to the public safety signal or Verizon Wireless? Verizon signal? Wireless. Okay, yeah. sure. I, and I'm happy to talk yeah. to that. Uh, again, for the record, my name is Jay Latore, RF engineer for Verizon Wireless. Again, thank you to the board and the public for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, let me just first start by answering your question. Yes, I, I think that is a legitimate concern due to the proximity. Uh, and I apologize. Mike, is it the center button? Yeah, center. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, yeah, we do not have a lot of distance from the proposed River Drive facility in the town of Hatfield. And uh, once we get done talking about this site in particular, I'll show you what the full footprint looks like. Um, but yeah, those concerns are legitimate. When we do our design process um, for these sites, we do take into consideration both the present coverage, uh, future you know, changes that we may have proposed to our existing footprint, and um, again, all our technologies, our powers, our center lines are put into consideration to ensure that what we propose when we come to a zoning meeting is what we think, based on all the information we have available at that time, to be the best uh, solution to provide coverage to the town and to provide performance to the town. I didn't know it was a legitimate concern until you started talking about the fact that it was a concern. Yeah, um, I understand that. sure, and, and let me give you a example that, you, um, that may be a little bit more beneficial. And I don't want to speak too much about other towns because this is, we want to focus on the town of Hadley, but I'll, I'll just give you a quick example. Um, over down in here towards this direction in the town of Amherst, uh, along with the mountain ridge between um, Amherst and, and South Hadley and Granby, um, we have a tower that goes towards the top of the mountain and it provides coverage. Uh, some of the coverage that you see from here, from the town of Hadley, and, and additional coverage into Amherst, Pelham, things like that. That site in particular is one of our um, large sites that, that bleeds into several other towns. And what that does is um, really causes interference issues and performance issues because you have a tower on the top of a mountain um, that you know, is providing coverage to areas that uh, really aren't necessary for it to cover. And so that's always one of our design challenges. Um, I know the gentlemen have spoken to some of the different bylaws that were adopted 
back in, in the late 90s, uh, at a time in the wireless communications period where, um, you know, the best solutions for most carriers were to find the tallest point in town and put a tower up as tall as the town would allow you to put it and then put out coverage as far as you could because you just wanted to get coverage to people. Now that uh, networks have been refined and become more mature in the last 15 years through the advancement of technologies, um, the addition of new services and uh, increased experience in the deployment of these as well as additional cell sites, the um, need to make big sites um, you know, that shoot out a long way has significantly decreased. And now we're focused much more on making sure that um, the sites have a limited amount of overlap. Certainly there has to be some overlap. If you can imagine driving in an area of reliable coverage and then another area in an adjacent town with reliable coverage, if the two don't meet, then you have a gap. And we talked about it right here, for example. Uh, if you look, uh, this coverage from the stop and shop tower, the uh, reliability comes to here. This coverage that comes from Northampton only comes up to about here. Uh, the right solution is something that fills this in. And when you fill this in, um, you know, the, the way RF propagates, you know, unfortunately, there, there's not like an um, invisible wall where you can just make it stop right here stop right here. There is some bleed over and that's necessary for your mobile phone to communicate with the different sites. But what we try to do as design engineers is to do so in a way that limits the overlap to no more than what we need. And so that's why you'll see with these sites as Attorney Fryman mentioned previously, whereas if you know maybe someone was here 15 years ago talking about you know some giant tower to blanket the town. Now our approach is smaller t towers that are designed specifically to provide coverage to the towns that they're built. That answer your question a little bit. I know there's a lot of different information, but you know, certainly in the last 15 years, our philosophy towards how to best provide reliable mm -hmm. services to our customers has changed. Sure. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Um, much like we discussed previously, uh, on this map, the brown is showing the current coverage in the uh, town of Hadley as provided by the other towers either out of town or the town um, site at behind Stop and Shop Plaza. The proposed River Drive facility is denoted on the map in purple and the green highlights the coverage that we um, believe will be provided by the town, uh, the River Drive facility, excuse me. So you'll see here uh, areas um, that are part of the town that were previously considered to be less than reliable by the town of, uh, by our standards, I should say, will now be in a more reliable area. And again, to the questions about overlap, you'll see here we've, we've got some overlap in between these two sites. But once we have these towers on air and providing services to the town, that gives us the ability to begin to pull back some of the sites surrounding the town that are overreaching unnecessarily. Because now the town will have uh, RF uh, footprints that are geared and designed to cover the roads, businesses, and facilities within the town. Um, Mike, I'm going to ask you to uh, go back one slide, I believe. Very good. Um, as I mentioned before, this is the slide that, that I asked everyone if we could just make a note that up here it says existing wireless coverage. Uh, but reality, what this is trying to portray is the uh, both the existing coverage today, which is in a lighter uh, green, and the proposed two facilities which is in this uh, a little more darker color right here and right here. And what you'll see is once you have um, the two sites in play, you start to fill in more properly the areas of the town that would today be considered by Verizon Wireless to be um, less than reliable. Um, these sites uh, are not meant to, to state that the entire town will have uh, reliable coverage with the two sites. There are still some areas of Hadley that may need um, you know, fur further development, 
Uh, but when we build sites, the first thing we look to do, as I mentioned previously, is optimization. So when a site comes on air, our performance engineers drive these areas to see if our propagation models are 100% accurate. Uh, if we find that a site is extending too far than it needs to be, we'll pull it in. And if a site is not extending far enough, we'll do optimization of our existing facilities to fill in the gaps, if you will. And that gets done in a number of ways through tr trending software that we use to monitor sites and drivers physically coming into the areas of testing equipment, recording drive data that we use to post-process to make sure that the areas that are important to be covered by these facilities are covered properly. And we have different ways to enhancing the performance of the towers once they're on air to make sure that we're <coughs> bringing the uh, service that we want to bring to the customers and we feel the, custom the uh, public in Hadley should expect. But tonight what I show is based on computer simulation of the different uh, pieces of information I presented to you, what we believe will be the new updated reliable coverage in the town of Hadley. Uh, Mike, if you could go forward, I believe, two slides. Okay, now, uh, yeah, this is perfect. So, um, what I, this slide is just trying to show, um, and I skipped over this slide earlier, is you know, when these sites come on air, uh, what the footprint starts to look like in the area. You've now got the River Drive facility on air in the northern portion of Hadley. You have the East Street facility over here, uh, closer to the Route 9 corridor. You have the uh, Stop and Shop facility right at the uh, Hadley Amherst border covering this area. Uh, now you'll start to see, for example, uh, Verizon Wireless is covering Route 9 uh, with reliable coverage throughout the stretch of Hadley, uh, ensuring that people within the town of Hadley, as they um, do their you know, daily work on Route 9, whether it's uh, professional uh, living there, agricultural, shopping, etc., that they'll have reliable Verizon coverage. And as they uh, move out from there into different areas of the town and out of town, that they'll be able to maintain their uh, expected level of service. Question on your, what does reliable service mean in, like, in terms of bars? Can you relate that to bars? You know, it, it's a tough question um, because every handset is different and the different manufacturers have um, different internal requirements as for what they call, um, you know, three bars, four bars, five bars. Um, yeah. You know, and again, it takes into account the things I've talked about as far as signal strength and signal quality, you know. Um, and, and the reason I, I, and I don't mean to, to beat around the bush with that question, but I'll give you a, a perfect example. If you've ever gone to, you know, a, a high spectator event, whether it's a, um, a sporting event or, you know, an antiques fair, something like that where you have a high congregation of people, uh, you may be close to a site and have what we would consider great RF. You have good power, you have good signal quality, and your phone may say, you know, wow, I've got four or five bars, this is great, I have good service. But if the sites are taxed because the amount of users is too high for the sites to carry, you could have a situation where you've got a lot of bars, but you still can't access the network. And to me, from Verizon's standpoint, we would consider that less than reliable. But I think if I understand the, the spirit of your question, you know, not, not talking, you know, as a Verizon wireless employee, but just, you know, a, a cell phone user much like yourself, you know, anytime when I see, you know, three bars, four bars, five bars, I feel like that starts to look like, a, you know, an area where I can do what I want to do with my cell phone. When I start to see two bars and one bar and, and no bar, um, you know, I start to think, well, there's probably less than reliable coverage. But again, you know, some phones have six bars, some have four, <coughs> and each chipset, whether it's a Motorola or an LG or an Apple phone, et cetera, et cetera, they have different requirements. But, okay. uh, those are some of the pieces that come into play when you see that on your phone. I don't think you got to sell us on the fact that more reliability is good. The question is, how do we get more reliability given the deck of zoning laws that we've got in town? That's the question. Hmm. Um, 
Attorney Fryman, I'd like to, to refer you to that, and I don't mean to okay, dismiss maybe. the question. I just, no, I'm not, not sure I'm the best statement. person. Yeah, I'm not, not sure I'm the best person to comment on that. So maybe I have a question that might be more up your alley. Sure. In the early days of cell phone, roaming was a big deal. Yep. And you're going to your rates. Your Verizon is one rate. If you get into T-Mobile territory, your rates are going to double or something mm -hmm. like that. And that seems to have become a non-issue. Uh, because I think you all share some services. I, I could speak to that a little bit. So, so certainly, roaming is still a player, but it's not as much as it used to be because there's become more parity between the different coverage providers as they've ramped up to meet some of the coverage footprints. You know, um, you know that Verizon offers today. You know, if you see the commercials, for example, Verizon boasts we have the largest uh, 4G network, and you know you see that our competitors have smaller networks. But depending on the technology, we, we may have similar footprints depending on the carrier locations, things like that. And each carrier has a different philosophy. One of the, th and I'm not going to sit here and, and and you know toot Verizon's horn, but one of the nice things I think about our company is we look to build in large cities. And also, you know, s smaller towns. We we consider any area that we can provide coverage to, you know, residents to be important to Verizon. Now, in regards to roaming, where I I think it comes into play uh, in two different ways. First of all, it really depends on the frequencies that the various uh, companies own. As part of our um, application to you, Verizon submitted our licenses that are granted by the FCC for us to roll out our technologies. Verizon is fortunate in this um, particular instance in this area of Western Massachusetts to hold four licenses. Our 700 band, 700 megahertz, 850 megahertz, uh, 1900 megahertz, and 2100 megahertz. And to, to keep it very simple, the, the lower the frequency, uh, the further the signal propagates. So that's why, for example, much of public safety is at an even lower signal so that their signals can propagate much further. Um, and you, you've prob we've all got experience with uh, FM versus AM, uh, for example, that gave you that recollection. Now, um, companies may not have the same footprint that Verizon has due to their different ownership of license. They may only own the smaller licenses like 1900 and 2100 megahertz. So uh, A, they may have to build more sites than a Verizon to, to create the same footprint. Or B, there are roaming contracts in between the customers in areas where um, one carrier may provide service and another carrier doesn't have it. And that's really dependent on the, the business negotiations between the companies. Um, what I can speak to is that another piece of this comes into play when we deal with situations regarding um, you know, significant loss of power or natural disasters. Um, we've had several different instances in the past couple of years, whether it be in Connecticut um, with some of the, the storms like uh, you know, Hurricane Sandy or in western Massachusetts with the tornado where we've had a significant number of sites for all the carriers lose power due to some kind of natural disaster. Uh, in many of those instances, um, one of the things, and um, Mr. Centauri, Mr. York spoke to this, all of our Verizon wireless sites we're proposing tonight come with some sort of emergency generator, generation backup, meaning that if for some reason the sites lose power, um, Verizon Wireless hosts technology that immediately keeps um, the sites powered up, um, either through the use of, um, I think uh, we mentioned in the first site we're using natural gas, uh, in the second site, um, propane. propane. Okay. And, um, and those sites are, are able to be monitored, you know, not only through those emergency generators, but also our battery backup. We know that depending on the competitor, not every competitor uh, necessarily has the same uh, emergency plan that we do. We have instances where we could have a significant power loss to all of the providers, and some of the competitors roam off of us because our service is up, reliable, and serving the, you know, the towns that it needs to serve, and their service is down. And those phones then roam off the Verizon network, for example. Well, I guess that was sort of what I was getting at. There seems to be an arms race going on that is largely invisible to the consumer. And I happen to be a Verizon customer, but I also know that we have permitted uh, T-Mobile, Sprint, um, 
AT&T, uh, AT &T, uh, Cellular One, I think, something like that. And there seems to be a lot of coverage in Hadley, albeit not necessarily Verizon coverage, but we seem, the, the cell phone user seems to be well served. And I'm just trying to get an understanding of, um, you know, you're showing us your coverage map, right. but is there a absolute coverage map? I, I think that, you know, there's, so to, to answer your question, that would be a difficult piece to, to put together because it would require a lot of communication between the carriers, some of which information they may feel to be proprietary, not necessarily as a company talking to the board, but the carriers talking to each other. Um, my experience working in this field is that when we go through the uh, site acquisition process, the first thing um, we do is when we look into a particular town is to see where our competitors are, to look for examples of co-location. And the, uh, the water tank that T-Mobile is on is a perfect example where, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, you know, if we can look to co-locate with our competitors, um, you know, that seems to be a better solution for Verizon because uh, we don't have to build a whole tower, and it's a better s solution for the town because they don't have to worry about the you know creation of another structure. Uh, in the case of the water tank, and we have other examples, that's just sometimes not fe feasible. And as Attorney Prime mentioned, there's a lot of different considerations that come into it. But um, you know, if you know, for, there could be sites where a landlord just isn't willing to work with us, things of that nature, or it just may not meet our coverage objectives. And one of the reasons one might choose a carrier is not necessarily the coverage it has in Hadley, but it's the coverage you get when you leave Hadley. That, that's you a great point. Around the country. That's a great point. You, you could have, um, you know, a great service in the town of Hadley and town of Northampton, but if you've got, um, you know, a campground in, you know, Greenfield or Bernardston or, or somewhere in Brattleboro, Vermont, or you have family in Poughkeepsie, New York, and your cell phone doesn't work there. Um, you know, that's one of the selling points. You know, not only um, what we offer in this town, but what does our footprint look like across the country? That's absolutely true. So, do I? I, I don't know if I um, if arms race is the best way to put it, but my if. You know, just my experience is that, um, yeah, I think all, all the carriers are doing what they can to bring their coverage to towns and cities because that's the best model for them. You know, and I understand that, and, and I think that does get to the sort of the, the heart of the question, and, and that is that, um, and I haven't taken the time to research the law, and I probably won't. But uh, if the objective is to provide service to the customer, if the customer is served, does it matter if it is served by Verizon versus well, AT&T? That is covered by the Telecommunications Act, and you're not permitted to discriminate among carriers. So yeah. if we come in and say, we don't have service, you, you have to disregard the other carrier's service. Okay. And now, somewhere I read something to the effect that, that the Telecommunications Act really talks about voice service and not data service. I'm not aware that it even anticipated data service at the time, and it just well, talks exactly. about wireless yeah. service. So um, I think it's treated, all, I, I think in the court you would be treated the same, whether it's data or whatever is wireless. So yeah. telecommunications, we call it telecommunications. So, and that's pretty clear about the discrimination. So, um, if, we can move on to mm -hmm. uh, yes. our photo yeah. sales. Mike, if you want to talk about the, sure. the site. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, for the record, Mike Libertine with all points. Uh, similar to the other site, we did a visibility analysis, and I'm just going to show you a few slides. One of the challenges we had, obviously, is if we were looking around town, we knew we were going to be outside of the uh, the uh, the district uh, which that was this was allowed by right. So we really wanted to find an area that we felt at least had some compatibility. So these shots here are just showing some of the immediate abutters and um, land uses in that that, that area. The uh, upper left-hand corner is actually taken uh, last summer. This shot from 
the 319 River Drive property looking to the north. And this is actually looking back at that same property from the north down River Drive. Uh, this site is just looking across the actual the agricultural field that is uh, at the edge of the driveway. Looking southward along <coughs> River Drive would be to our right. And I believe this is just across the street. If you go to the next slide. Uh, and this is all part of the uh, application documentation. You can actually see here, uh, this is looking, uh, I guess it would be northeastward up River Drive. You can actually see one of the uh, stacks associated with the uh, Montgomery Rose facility. This is just looking across the field. Uh, over towards Amherst, and again across the street from the driveway, and to the south of our site. That um, lower left picture, you probably couldn't find on the property like that in all of the northeast. That's <laughs> it, that's probably about four miles south of your site, three miles south Where's of your that? site. Right here, lower right, lower right, lower right. That's way lower up. right. That's, no, sir. That's right next to the East Street. That's close yes, to that's close to the East Street. street. Yeah, that's yeah. near the East Street site. Yeah, it's not on. It's on River Drive but it is between Rocky Hill Road and Huntington Road, and it is uh, at least two and a half to three miles away from your location. You folks know the town better than I, but um, I will respect, respectfully disagree with you, but that's fine. If we go to the next slide. Regardless, again, we had, we had challenges here. I think that was um, pretty clear from the original portion of the presentation. So we really did want to try to find an area. And not only that, once we did find a site that was suitable, we felt as though uh, it was important to try to do something that would blend in. And so we did try several different options at this site. Uh, we did take a look originally. We knew we could go with a fairly short tower, 80 feet, which is relatively short in this industry. Uh, we looked at a standard monopole here because, again, that would provide uh, the most uh, flexibility for a carrier. But once we took a look at some photos, we felt as though, geez, we should go back to the drawing board here. And so we took a look at, well, I think somebody mentioned about the, um, what they call a monopine or the, the faux tree. We also tried that as well. Uh, but we also had some challenges with the uh, State Historic Preservation Office that had some interest in this site and wanted, again, something that was done to blend in. Mike, if you could go back one slide, please, thanks. This is, again, the view shed map. And I think it's a little bit more uh, in, uh, pertinent here to talk about because it's not an existing structure. From our perspective, there are existing smokestacks that we are finally uh, uh, adopted as our design element. But again, two mile radius, just to give you an idea, with the Montgomery Rose site right here in the center, and that's our proposed tower site. You can see that footprint, uh, in this case, of visibility tends to move eastward across some of the open fields. and. I think one of the things, just so you'll understand what we do, this is actually based on originally a computer model that takes into consideration both topography and tree cover. So that obviously there are obstructions as you move further away from a site. But one of the things here that I think is important to keep in mind is that, uh, and we'll see this in some of the photographs we've selected, uh, right out in front of the site obviously you're looking at the facility and you're looking um, more or less directly at uh, the proposed stack. As you start to move eastward, you'll start to see that these views diminish uh, pretty rapidly, both because of the scale of the project and because of the distance as you move away. Now, if you'd go to the next one, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, again, we just selected some representative shots. This is uh, the photo that's essentially right in front of the host property. We flew a balloon at this site, and that's uh, represented here. But when, when did you fly the balloon last? Uh, the last time we did it, I've got a document. I want to say it was... Uh, July 8th or August 8th, so it was in the summer. We've done it multiple times, but I do have it documented, and I can get you that in just a second. No, but as, as the abutter, we got notification that it was going to be with recently, yes. and, and it never Unf did. Yeah, unfortunately, we ran into a bad stretch of weather, and uh, we did have, that. that's true, and I'm glad you brought that up, because there had been a public notice, or at least a butter notice, uh, for a weekend balloon float. And uh, again, we just unfortunately ran into some really tough weather uh, both days. We had a backup day Sunday. We tried twice. We tried two times. And mm -hmm. when it was public notice, we put it in the paper. Okay. We tried to do it two different weekends. Great. Thank you. So again, uh, that was just unfortunate. We were hoping to do it right before the original hearing date so that folks would have another opportunity to take a look at this. Uh, but these pictures actually were taken uh, this past summer. Um, Again, we float a balloon tethered to the 80-foot height. The balloon's about four feet in diameter. 
and you can see the existing stacks that are here. Those are guide. Some of these small appurtenances that you see actually have guy wires attached to them. Our proposed facility will not be just because structurally will not require that type of support. And then we drop in a, uh, a simulated model that's uh, a 3D model based on the actual physical design. We also build a model of that two mile area that I showed you earlier so that we can actually put virtual photo points into our model to make sure that what you're looking at here is to scale and to size. Um, these are, this one is just slightly bigger than the largest stack that's here today. Uh, and again, no guy wires. This is another shot, uh, very similar perspective out in front, uh, but this would be with a bit of the building uh, obscuring the back portion of the, the property and the actual compound area. Uh, there is a tower on the horizon somewhere here. I think it gets washed out of this picture. But again, we felt as though this setting uh, seemed to work pretty well uh, in terms of some kind of compatibility. Again, the balloon is shown here. And uh, this is again along River Drive, is essentially at the intersection to the south. And that would be, uh, again, the, the facility as proposed. Again, a little bit further away, coming from the south, and again the facility as it's dropped in. This is actually eastward on Knightley Road uh, and it's across an open field. Again the balloon was in the air here and then we've simmed in the stack to be similar to the existing facilities that are there today. And again now as you start to move away further uh, to the east it gets a little bit more difficult because there are, there's obviously some infrastructure and uh, you know other structures uh, intervening. This is only at a half mile away, and as you can see, at a half mile, you start to really kind of lose um, the visibility. Or uh, it's certainly from point A to point B, you could theoretically say that it's visible, but uh, you really start to lose out. And I think as you go to the next, the next one, this is really kind of the limits of anyone being able to really discern a structure. Uh, at about the one mile mark, and that's out on Knightley Road if you get close to Roosevelt Road. Uh, here, again, now that we're over a mile away, about a mile and a quarter, you would really have to know what you're looking for to really start to see that. But uh, again, there's multiple photos uh, and the full visibility report for both sites that are as part of the application. Mm -hmm. So you asked a question about how, you know, given the constraints of the of the zoning bylaw, um, how do we overcome those issues when we have a, you know, we need coverage in an area that's not that's outside of the overlay district? And you, there are two tools that you have. One is that you have a waiver require a waiver provision in your bylaws that allows you to waive strict uh, strict following of the bylaw, and that's in section 14.9. In this case, I would say that you do have the justification to to grant that waiver in that you, you know, to justify the coverage. And you also have the telecommun Federal Telecommunications Act, which um, provides that you know, towns cannot um, act in a way that would deem to be, um, to prevent coverage, to prohibit coverage. And in this case, given the, the limitations in the bylaw, it would be um, arguably uh, have the effect of prohibiting us to provide the coverage in the town. And that's um, also provides a pretty liberal um, application when you go to the courts uh, because they've interpreted that to me to give but to give town boards very a lot of flexibility so for example in a town where wouldn't where you don't have a use variance um, the courts have deemed that uh, interpretation under the telecommunications act to allow the board to to give a use variance um, uh, you don't have to follow the um, appeal process under 40a if we deny a permit we can go directly to federal court we don't have to go through the appeal process um, the, also in the court, they don't give deference to the town boards necessarily. They don't have to give deference to the town boards, which you would in the state court. So um, it allows for a lot of flexibility with the, with town boards when they um, have restrictions that would otherwise you know, be in violation of the Telecommunications Act. So that's a, a very um, helpful tool for you. So, um, and then just uh, going over the benefits of this site, again, you know, the same concerns and the same benefits that we would provide at the other location, which is um, for public safety. Again, um, this is a, a critical site uh, for, for the town uh, in that they don't have the coverage in the northern part of the town. And we also met, we met with fire 
and police. Uh, we also met with the town has a consultant that they uh, use for their telecommunications, Ron Frost of uh, Pinnacle Wireless. And he um, couldn't be here, but he did um, provide us with a letter uh, that I can give to you and submit to you. And basically it summarizes and says that North Hadley is a must site to give the increase in coverage needed. So, um, and he was, uh, he participated in our discussions, and we would be working with him in um, installing the town's equipment. So if we could submit that as a part of the record. Do we have uh, documentation from the property owner as to your bullet point number two there? <clears throat> in terms of, we have it as part of our lease. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's so all part of. So the property owner has agreed that the town will have access to the site for through public our, safety? Through our, prop, through our lease, through okay. our, the rights of access to our lease. So. so again, public safety and then as far as um, the benefit and economic development and having business and be able to have better service and the residents of the town have better improved service. Um, and then the, the waivers that we need for this site, again, the, the site plan, the size and scale of the plans, uh, being outside of the overlay district, and again, uh, would uh, be very, um, uh, I think that you have the uh, authority to grant the waiver under your uh, waiver bylaw. Um, the 55 foot height restriction, which would be 80 foot tall. Um, you know, pull. And then we do have a, a similar situation that we're replacing the um, tower is less than twice the height of the tower from uh, it's located closer to the greenhouses and that's based on the other uh, uses of this in development and other structures that are on the site. And again, we built the tower to have the integrity so that it wouldn't it doesn't collapse so that we don't see a risk in being closer than having that uh, extensive setback. And you're going to own so, this one or is the... This will be, uh, no, this is our, no. so we didn't ask for the waiver of the bond in this case. Could, and so. on, this, <clears throat> on this particular one, the, uh, the, could you get, I'm not looking for a copy of your lease, but could you get a copy of the section that says we would have the town would have free access? I see what it says as far as that. I just know that we have, you know, yeah, I don't know that it's specific. It's specific. I'll look and see what it says. But I know that we have all the rights to, to our invitees and, you know, um, yeah, but I mean, if you could just do you, what, what, what you said, mm -hmm. could you get us a copy that shows that? Yeah. I mean, I don't, because okay. I, don't, I don't care, I don't want to okay. see your lease, that's your private business mm -hmm. between the okay. two parties. We just want to see where that is okay. delineated, mm -hmm. okay? And I think it would be helpful also to know the term of the length of the lease. I'm mean, going to assume it may be similar to the lease, yeah, they're typically the 20 years with rights okay. to extend. Okay, because even if we have unfettered access to it, it's only for two years. Oh, I understand. Yeah. Right. Um, so the um, scale, no, I have no problem with that. 55 foot height restriction, eh, maybe not a huge problem. Twice the height of the tower from buildings. Uh, I think that, my recollection from drafting this was that that was to protect uh, third parties. Right. And if you want to put a tower, if you want to take the risk of having a tower next to your greenhouses and having it fall on your greenhouses, it's up to the property owner to protect themselves vis-a-vis -vis Verizon. Right. So I'm not worried about that one particularly. So what we just have to deal with is the location, to my mind. Any other questions from the board? I guess I would like maybe something from the property owner stating that they're aware of that and they're agreeing to waive that because it really is to protect the property owner and if they want to put, you know, the smokestack near their building, sort right. of. I mean, the lease exhibit, this the plans are actually lease exhibits to the lease, so they have it right. as part of their yeah. lease of where sort it's of located. At your own risk. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. We told them not to do it if they want to do it. Well, well, I think by showing you the lease exhibit, it would show that they've approved the location. Yeah. Anything else from the board? Mr. Zagradek. Yeah. I certainly agree we do, as a planning board, have wiggle room, as Bill was indicating. However, I do not think we can have wiggle room as notable as some, as noble as some may think the tower may be for 
public safety, I don't think we have any wiggle room to deny zoning. The, the zoning is a is something that's given to us by the town meeting, and I I absolutely disagree that we cannot overrule zoning uh, from that point of view. We're not and so either it's in the limited business or local business. That's Bill is going to do some research on that. But it's certainly outside the district. It's in the agricultural residential district. It's not even in the limited business because it's about a thousand feet off the road, not 300. But the but the zoning bylaw gives the planning board authority to go outside the district. I well it in it doesn't allow us to put it in the agricultural residential district. And the other thing is, I'm sure that the uh, the attorney, Ellen Fryman, has uh, kind of anticipated something like this because when I did receive a letter, she, I think the the only her next step would be, and I'm not talking for her, her next step would be to go to the zoning board of appeals, because as she said in the butter's letter. Uh, Verizon Wireless application for a special permit for the installation from the Hadley Zoning Board of Appeals. And, and I think that was a typo. I apologize. Well, it, <laughs> it may not may have been a Freudian no, slip as I well, anticipating the that. fact that you are not uh, no. so confident in your case. Our specific no. authority here is strict compliance with the requirements of these rules and regulations may be waived when, in the judgment of the board, such action is in the public interest and not inconsistent with the Wireless Communications Services District bylaw. Um, now, I did speak briefly with Attorney Fryman, and she has uh, proposed uh, posed a question to town council, which uh, she represents will be at the expense of the applicant. Uh, it's a question we might have asked, too, as to exactly how far that goes in the light of the Telecommunications Act. So uh, we have not. I did pose that. I heard nothing. So. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I heard nothing. Uh, um, could mean that uh, Joel's a hockey plant? player, so he might be watching. Yeah. yeah. What about the that sewer plant? Did you do you have any documentation that you actually went and looked there at one, it? Or? There was one site that said water tanks. I don't know if that's the no, same. No, site. no, that's on that's on Mount State. That's on Mount State. Mount Water. Okay. I don't know. If you can um, check that out. Yeah. I mean, it's that's it's viable. It's really it's within eyesight of. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there was some reason why that was not suitable. Well, again, we wouldn't be in a situation to want to be, you know, asking for more waivers. I, I would um, be happy to give you this as a summary of the telecommunications act as it's um, applicable to um, our, uh, you know, to Massachusetts and Massachusetts cases. And, I look uh, copy. So I only won't copy that. Um, the guy on the board. So, I mean, it does emphasize the flexibility um, that you have, uh, especially when it means a prohibit, um, prohibiting service, which, um, as you saw, as we demonstrated tonight, without having a tower in that area, which was outside the overlay district, it, your bylaw does do the same as, a, you know, it's in effect, prohibiting us from having necessary service in areas where we need it. So I think in that, and also, um, you know, that section of the waiver where it says in the public interest, I mean, certainly what we've stated here tonight and what was the testimony from uh, uh, our police chief that uh, you know it's necessary and definitely beneficial and required for the public interest so so based on that I wholeheartedly feel that you have the um, ability to provide that waiver that we requested and we need so I will um so what we're looking for is perhaps an opinion of town council as to extent of waiver authority. Where did Mrs. Chung look up? She left. She could push that along if she was here. Um, Jim, you wanted a uh, some 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 kind of lease provisions for access. Correct. Mm -hmm. I guess I have one more question on that. So if it's our equipment up on the tower or on the chimney, do we have access to the site to go repair it or you guys or who repair it or do we need 
you would be going to take care of your equipment. So we need not only. Well, we need access to the site. Which means we could we could cross. We could go across the property right. by their right of way. Right. And once we're in their compound, we would have to provide our own means to get to the antenna on the pole. Correct. So, so not just they're going to put it up for us, but access to maintain it. For us, yeah. yes, yes. yes that. Yeah, at this at this location, what I had proposed to the uh, EMS services is to provide a shed and hook that up um, electrically to our service. So no meter, no electrical bill from the utility company. That service is also backed up by our generator, so the repeater doesn't go down. And for the development of a new site, I bring in a new telephone service to a demarcation point outside of our shelter, and that's a fiber optic service provided by Verizon Landline. That would also enhance uh, their service at that location uh, due to some of the antiquated uh, copper lines that are out there now. So with the fiber optic service it's a higher level faster type of uh, service that uh, would just only enhance what they have there now now that the monopole or the, or the site at 319 that's not going to have a ladder on a chimney that's going to require a boom lift or something to get up to it uh we could do it either way we can have climbing pegs on that that at the completion of the job remove those and store them on site put them back up when it's time for access or well, yeah. no, it doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm just asking what you're proposing. I, I, I'm not telling you, I'm asking you any questions. Yet, just wondering how you would do it. No, we haven't got that far in yet. Okay. But most likely, it would be all man left access. Okay. Okay, so then the third thing you're going to do is you're going to just you know, investigate the, um, the, how the sewer pumping station on Stockbridge Road was evaluated. Mm -hmm. And. I am going to try to track down um, the local business discrepancy in um, in the bylaw. No, I think you said Stockwell Road. Stockbridge. Stock, 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 Stock Bridge. Stock, Stock Bridge, Bridge, yes. Sorry. Stock I'm Bridge sorry. Um, Stock Bridge. Right. One word, Stock Bridge. Yeah. Okay. I got all those only events going back to it. Yeah. I have a lot of them to it. Yeah, yeah, I looked at what Lisa did. I think that somebody may have just taken it on themselves to say that when Route 47 South was changed from business to local business, that it remained in the district even though it shouldn't have. Right. So we may just, it, it may be a typo one way or another. But thank you for having me on. Okay, so. And likewise for the fourth. For the yep, for the fourth, the same thing. At seven fifteen. Right. Okay. When's election, Richard Remark? Um, okay. I think the second Tuesday of April. So I'll come at the, um, right, we'll have the copies of the presentation. We won't need the, the PowerPoint again. And right. Just no, right. To address these issues. Yep. Okay. So it's mostly documents at this point. Mm -hmm. okay. How do we determine the decommissioning bond? The what? The decommissioning Right. There, there will be one on this one, I think. Yeah. We put it, we put it in the yeah. The uh, just for your information. So I know you. We, after April eighth, assuming that's the election day, this board will be different. Okay. Oh. Okay. Hopefully, I mean, we want to make we want to shoot for decision by the end by the by the obviously right. by that that's time. That's but Lisa has decided not to run for re-election. Mm -hmm. That means there would be three members left on the board, right? You said that, that's what you said. That means there'd be three members left on the board. So if a decision needed to be made, you would not have a supermajority. Okay, but there would be one more meeting after the fourth. So. There would be, oh, be, there'd be two meetings oh, two after the fourth. Two okay. meetings after the fourth, okay. 
We did put a letter in um, from our and from Carlos that, that, um, that yeah. spells out the cost and okay, to, bring them, like, to use that. So I have four matters regarding the river road site, and I have one regarding the East Street site. Yeah, correct. That's right. Yeah. As long as we can, the biggest one that I see, the biggest obstacle I see to the to the fourth is getting something from attorney from town council. Um, the other three, I think, are pretty straightforward. Within your control. Yes, maybe a better way to say it. Um, okay. Um, possibly getting a hold of the board of selectmen to to help or or um, David Nixon. To help get it, get a, get a decision or or okay. some for words. The sooner we get these, for the sooner we get these up and get the public service equipment up and emergency service up. Right. So we're anxious after all this time to. Do well, at least, at least on the fourth, I think one of those should be pretty well easy enough to decide. That's the East Street one. Mm -hmm. okay. And the 319 will drive hopefully be down to maybe one item after that. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I wanted to thank the gentleman with the red tie and the argyle shot socks for his uh, presentation. Oh. <laughs> and pick on the man. It's really I learned a lot about the business that I never ever knew about. I, yeah, that was really, you're, really you're, a you're, good, you're, great job. You're, you're technical, you, your technical. Your, your technical interpret. Your technical explanation was very good for the layman. Very good. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, Appreciate it. Was a great job. Yeah, my yeah. <laughs> you mastered <train. laughs> And even though I'm an engineer, I don't claim to understand a lot of the stuff of the, of the technical jargon of RF, and you did a good job. I feel very fortunate to have grown up in Western Massachusetts and have my technical design area be the place where I've, uh, you know, grown, been educated, in, and, and live in. So I appreciate the, uh, the compliments. Thank you. All right. Anything else? If not, motion, motion to adjourn. adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is history. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, folks.